Hannah, and thank you, Fred, of course, for our ongoing partnership. And good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be with you this morning uh, to offer a few comments about Excel and why it's even more relevant now. We're meeting today and every Monday, actually every day, really, because COVID-19 has revealed deep vulnerabilities and disparities within our sector, our community, and our world. Fred has cataloged a couple of those for us. We now know that the virus is going to linger for 18 or 24 more months, during which time all of our stakeholders are counting on us to fulfill our missions now more than ever. That feels like a lot of pressure. And in fact, it is. Whether you're a funder, a nonprofit leader, or a community ally, you know there's no going back to the normal of March or any other time. We can only go forward working and thinking differently, adapting to new uncertainties, and using the tools at our disposal to help our agencies and our community navigate. But here we are, together again on a new yet eerily similar Monday morning, wondering how can we move on amidst the pressures of working from home, caring for children, staying distant, and connecting virtually instead of in the high-touch ways we all crave. While there's no guidebook yet, there are some principles and practices to help steer us. I'd like to think that Excel is one of the brighter, better stars to help us maneuver deftly through these unsettled days. Since 2014, the Benter Foundation has been working with Derek Feldman and the Forbes Funds to bring the most promising practices in fundraising, friend raising, marketing, and movement building to Pittsburgh. The fundraising landscape here in Pittsburgh is now keenly competitive. Funders are telling everyone to diversify revenue and cultivate individual donors. Yet we all need new tools, good data, and digital knowledge to do that. This change can't be willed into being. It takes investment, both in talented people and with the financial capital and systems necessary to support their growth. We've determined that this is an important area for our foundation, and we've invested over the past six years to help our grant and community partners secure the resources they need, they need, in order to have more money for mission. First through Velocity and now as Excel, we've collaborated on a sequential model of professional development that is at once intensive, actionable, and effective. Over time, with Derek's leadership and with the Forbes funds, the team has developed learning experiences tailored to Pittsburgh that work. Graduates of Excel report heightened fundraising capacity, increased campaign results, and better confidence in their skills. But despite that winning formula, Excel too had to hit pause this spring to listen to and take stock of the changes around us. The insight from our survey and those spring conversations were clear. The elements that made Excel so special had to be adapted in order to meet you and your needs exactly where you are today. Thanks to Derek, Fred, Hannah, the two Hannahs actually, Olivia, Preston, and the Forbes Funds team, the result is a more flexible, tighter, and still action and results oriented virtual version of Excel. The barrier of tuition has all but been removed for this upcoming session because participation will be even more heavily subsidized by more funders who believe, like us, in the value of this work. Content will be delivered in 90-minute snippets rather than in all-day, in-person sessions. Peer exchanges and personal time with Derek are still central. This version will help you communicate with donors who are themselves seeking connection and ways to help. Virtual Excel will help you fundraise through an end of year campaign and through strategies that you developed. Since all of COVID's tools and teaching are geared toward helping you be more effective in a COVID laced world. I hope that you'll find a way to pri prioritize participating in Excel now. 
If you're like me, you may not welcome one more obligation on your calendar. We already have so much we must do each day. But this is one time where obligation flips into unparalleled opportunity. In bite-sized chunks through the mentorship of local allies, national experts like Derek, and the support of many others, this is an invitation to you, our colleagues in the field, to benefit from an investment in yourself. Our sector is exceptionally good at putting the needs of others before our own. Here's a chance to do both, to gain data-driven messaging and fundraising tools that will enhance your own professional growth. That's the something for you while serving the support generating needs of your agency and of our community. That's the something that helps all of us. If you need help making this case to your board or to your leadership, send me an email and I'll gladly uh, help because I really believe in the importance of this work right now. There may not yet be a guidebook for fundraising in these uncertain times, but there is an exceptional navigational system right here within reach to guide you and your fundraising this season. It's Excel. On this still unsettled journey of how to get more resources for your mission, I hope you know that you don't have to pilot these uncharted waters alone. Many people are in your corner. We need you to succeed now more than ever. And we want you to have the tools that work for the long run, not just to get you through the gauntlet of COVID-19. And now let me turn the conversation over to Derek Feldman so that you can see why his notable skills and expertise are so valuable for our community right now. Thank you, Fred, for this opportunity and to the Forbes Fund team. And most of all, thank you, Derek, for your tremendous support of Pittsburgh over these years. Derek, take it away. Well, hello everybody. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful that I'm with you this morning. Obviously it would be even better if we had time together in person, uh, of course, but uh, given our time, we'll, we'll make do here. And, and thanks Kathy and Fred and everybody else. Uh, I, I wanna begin today with some things that we are learning um, because I know that our community conversation today is not just around Excel, but around the situation we find ourselves in which is fundraising and marketing right now uh, in a time where not only does necessarily are things uncertain, but things are changing. Some things for the better and some things for a redefinition of what it means to be involved in our causes from the individual public standpoint. Um, I, some of you I've met before and some of you I've not as I've scrolled through the many uh, sort of viewpoints here to look at who's on our screen today. And there's kind of two things where I want you to, to kind of understand where I come from. Specifically, I focus on how to get the public involved in social issues. Now, that involvement comes from two primary premises that we know about everybody when we look at social issues. One is, is that most of the public do not define themselves as donors or volunteers. They define themselves as supporters of the immense work of social issues that you're trying to address. They support people that you are trying to help. They support the families that are going through COVID. They support the individuals that are fighting for the same beliefs that you believe in too as well. And so one of the key things as I look at it right now is, as we think about our time together, which is how does the public engage as supporters and how are you going to really help drive that narrative and help them understand that the work that you are doing for others, you are merely a conduit that anybody can address the issues and, the, and help the people that you're trying to help overall. The second thing that's really, really important as we kind of look at this, and that is that not only is the public supporters, but, the, but a lot of people tend to be on the sidelines waiting for that opportunity to act. Now, sometimes us as causes create unique opportunities to act all of the time. Um, we create ways to volunteer, we used to in person and so on. And some of us create a lots of opportunities to give. And quite honestly, some of our organizations are only set up as those opportunities to give. Might be restrictions on health or other kinds of 
issues that, that challenge uh, engagement in any other ways. But what we find is not that the public lacks a desire to do anything for the work that you're trying to do, it's that desire is often suppressed by so many other things going on. And right now, I'm sure you've been invited to many Zoom meetings, including this one. I'm sure you've been asked to do so many other things on so many other social issues in general. And so as you go forward, we have two major things to understand is, is that our the public and our Pittsburgh citizens and residents and everybody who isn't around the region want to do good and get involved. They're mired with so many different ways and it's your job as leaders to try to show them that pathway as much as possible. And that pathway can be quite busy uh, overall. In March of this year, as we started to look at fundraising and marketing, we had two primary charges that I asked my research team. We have a full research team right here at Influence SG. And we do two things when we look at that research. How is the public engaging? Not just what our nonprofits doing, because that's, that's an important piece, but I have to understand from their perspective, since they're the ones we're asking to get involved either as donors or as volunteers or in many other different kinds of ways. But specifically, what were they doing when it came down to fundraising and responding to the calls to donate by maybe some of you and others? And we learned two part particular pieces. Um, one is, is that the initial reaction and response by many, not just in Pittsburgh, but nationwide to nonprofit calls to actions to give were quite enormous. And in fact, it, it, it was one where, not that it was a surprise, because we knew again that that sort of muscle was there to give and be a supporter, but we didn't know how it would happen when we're all going through this problem together. You know, you can't necessarily compare what's going on in COVID to a natural disaster that happens in one part of the country, knowing that COVID is widespread, right? It addresses so many of us, so many different populations. It doesn't discriminate in a way that it approaches things in a way. And so as we look at it, we say, if COVID from that standpoint is happening, how will the public react knowing that they may not know anybody at this time, or they might, might know somebody who's close. The initial reaction was very positive, and some of you probably reaped some good rewards from your initial call to actions that were out there to say, you know, give support right now, families need it, and, and people were supportive, even the foundation community like Kathy's and others um, were reactionary. The, the question now, though, becomes, where does that momentum go to, and what does that look like for the remainder of the year? While our initial response was positive and obviously could always be much more, don't get me wrong. The real question now is, is how does this change our initial reaction and the ongoing changes that we have occurring? How does that sort of position ourselves and our organizations for ongoing resources throughout the year uh, in general? And I think that there were two primary learning lessons that my team through all of the research came out with uh, is one is maintaining donor motivation has been the hardest thing in this time. While the public, and I'm sure yourselves, are exhausted with the COVID scenario and situation that's going on, so are our donors uh, as well. So is the general population overall. Maintaining motivation and relevance to the moment is the hardest thing, especially when, you know, historically, our nonprofit fundraising message has been aspirational it's been opportunistic for things that could occur in the future, which right now it's very difficult to talk about those things in solicitations when the future might be a little unknown uh, overall. So one is, is how to maintain donor motivation. And in a lot of our qualitative interviews with thousands of Americans throughout the country, some even participated in Pittsburgh, what we discover is, is that many of them said, I'm as tired as I am and I know so many others are and we're all in this situation together. But at the same time, what they asked for is more clarity, specifically what is necessary right now? What do you need from me right now? And making our solicitations as clear. And if you take an Excel class, recall about the call to action, the CTA, specifically how will my contribution of my time my connections and my relationships and my dollars add value to someone right now in this moment knowing that we can only sort of plan very short term versus where we go in the future the second thing that i bring up not just besides donor motivation is uh, is understanding truly how your issue 
is how the work that you do relates to the current moment that we're in uh, overall. Now, some in the arts community have looked at Crip being a resource, being a utility overall. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute with some lasting sort of comments to you as we go through here. But in essence is, is that we are all going through here and making that perspective known. You know, I've seen, we have tracked solicitations and response rates where direct mail and email solicitations are not even bringing up COVID in their con. That's not the reality of what's actually occurring in society right now. And so what we are beginning to track is how do we talk about COVID in our fundraising solicitations? How do we talk about how the families that we are working with are affected by it? Because not everybody is affected in the same way. That knowledge and education is very, very important as we go through. So that kind of leads me to one final piece before I get to some, some lasting comments here. And that is we always in our Excel uh, area talk about knowledge, attitude, and behavior all of the time. So in your line of work, you have to think about it this way. What do Pittsburgh, what do our Pittsburgh fellow citizens, colleagues, and residents know? Because whatever they know, they take an attitude towards that, either positive or negatively, and they behave, either they act or they don't act. And so right now, I ask that you go back to your own internal staff conversations and your boards and say, Right now in this moment, what do people know about what we're doing, whether it relates to COVID or not? Where does that come from, what they know? And if they don't know, what, what is the behavior that we're trying to incite and how do we couple and make stronger solicitations that for, help people understand what they should know, why they should care, why they should care in this particular moment and what action will they take right now that will help somebody that we're serving? Those are crucial questions that we not only ask in Excel, but you should be asking yourself too. Now we've been working with many organizations over the course of the last six months to not only sort of research and, and, and monitor and observe at the same time, test different things. And I'm gonna share with you now some of those key things that we've learned. On the first piece, as I've already talked about, as you'll see on the next slide, which is having utility overall. You, the, a lot of arts organizations have, have been very successful in this way, creating alternative ways to be helpful and useful. We've seen arts organizations in pivoting and providing educational content online where they couldn't do it necessarily in person to supplement maybe what might be happening or not happening in schools and so forth. The question for you, which we should all be asking ourselves is what, how can we be useful? How can we help others as well? It's not just our beneficiaries, but help them understand uh, too. We're with the disabilities organizations that, that was helping parents understand how to have conversations with people um, as they encounter different things. They were pivoting some of their messaging and language, providing case studies and resources uh, as well. Being useful uh, during this time is very, very important. Help others around you see the utility that you offer, not only on your issue, but on your space. The next thing that we see overall here is making sure that we focus on one-to-one -one conversations. You know, in this primarily digital world that we are living in right now, as much as some of us are venturing out, uh, I ask that you continue to maintain constant one-to-one -one conversations. Many of our fundraisers that we have tracked um, through over the course of this time have seen 30 to 40% increases in gifting once they've incorporated digital and one-on-one -on -one conversations. Doing one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls, video on or video off. Doing one-on-one -on -one sort of calls to meet with other parents. I, I actually had a, uh, an organization, we tracked it a Zoom call with two families that they were helping with three sets of different donors to hear directly from those families what they were dealing with in COVID right now. This is a time to be a little creative. Remember, the vast majority of our donors are not going to be experiencing the same thing that our families are going through. This is your opportunity to be very, very good storytellers. Have those one-on-one -on -one conversations in addition to our digital relationship building that we're doing. In the third thing that you see here on the screen, um, specifically this relates to digital constituency engagement. Uh, I remember seeing lots of phone calls and emails right after sort of in that March time frame, after we started to shut things down and it was, we're going to do all of our special event program online and hopefully we get the same, uh, hopefully we get our same sort of 
uh, fundraising dollars that we did with our events and so on. What we have discovered is that digital engagement is really a new offering. It isn't a replacement strategy. And we have to be very clear about that. Expecting the same thing is unlikely going to happen. The real question for you then becomes is how do we use digital to offer new things? How do we not just replace, but how do we supplement a little bit of what we're doing uh, as well? We've got fundraising teams at organizations where right now, while they'll do sort of small group environments that I just talked about, while they'll learn some things, they, they'll hold, hold once a month conversations, open conversations amongst their leadership and board members with donors to talk about the issues. They'll, that's not a, they used to not be able to do that. Um, they, they've always wanted to, some of them said, but this is a really good opportunity. Some have used videos of executive directors sharing on a weekly basis some of the things that families are going through uh, in a, using an iPhone or something just to capture a very short video overall. Again, digital constituency engagement, there are unique and different opportunities rather than just replacing what we already have overall. The next thing, the fourth piece that you'll see on the screen right now is remember that supporter mentality. And one of the, one of the other elements that we constantly are looking at in solicitations is how, how are we going to talk about COVID? You, you heard me discuss that overall. Um, we, um, we, were, we were testing some campaigns for an organization that does digital um, computer science technology training for K-12 schools in the country. And, you know, we started to pivot and tested their messaging and started to talk about computer science and being that students need to be resilient, re be ready to be for the challenges of using technology on a daily basis and so forth. That kind of message change in our direct mail solicitations had a 8.5% higher response rate than the same time last year in the same solicitation period. In addition to that, one other change that we did in imagery is showcase a real person learning computer science during the age of COVID in imagery, not just typical stock images and so forth. In that particular test, we had a 6.5% higher response rate than in others. Again, as you can see, testing these different things and talking about the realities of where we are right now hasn't actually hasn't challenged or, or hurt anything in terms of fundraising. And in fact, it's made it more real. Um, and the imagery that we used was not staged imagery, it was of the student's um, parent actually taking it themselves and the parent then we had in the picture too as well. Again, small tweaks. These, I bring these up to showcase to you that this is a moment in showing relevance even in our solicitations is important. Keep in mind that our audience of our donors is already affected by this too as well and understanding that through one-on-one -on -one conversations is very, very key. My last thing that I have here on the screen for you is sort of developing small group engagement is really key. Uh, I work with some organizations where what they're doing is family unit times and opportunities. They're creating toolkits to have conversations at the dinner table because, well, quite honestly, <laughs> they needed some additional things to talk about. They've been together for a while. And specifically, those toolkits included things like films and short things to bring up, conversation starters with parents. They, there's also an opportunity for lots of peer engagement. We're seeing donors doing Zoom fundraising peer engagement pieces together with some of our clients. We still can do small peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And a lot of that was actually prior to our COVID piece and have prior, prior to the COVID uh, area overall. And it has been as effective too as well. We'll be talking about some of those in the Excel courses. So I end with this last thing, which I talked about supporter overall. And, and on your screen here, you're going to see a model that we constantly um, sort of utilize, and it's called our constituency and supporter model, model. For you as organizations, we have what we call a journey or a pathway that we have to bring people through. One is, is understanding who we are, um, helping them understand our issue primarily first. How are we going to reach out and build that awareness to then understanding how we can be useful and helping them overall too as well. We bring them through this process because not everybody immediately becomes a donor uh, as well. And as we know, the path towards donation, the path towards higher levels of being an advanced supporter as you see on the right hand side of your screen is all based in our ability to be useful during this time, to maintain those relationships and create an opportunity of learning right, knowledge and change and so forth. 
And so in our Excel program, this is something that all participants go through to help create a new way that people go, that we attract people and bring people through the organization uh, overall as well. Regardless if you take our course, and I'm hopeful that you will, you'll join us this fall, as Kathy and others have said, this is something that you as an organization should say and, and sort of go around the table right now, especially if we're planning between now and the end of the year. This can be your end of year path for fundraising. What are we going to do now to try to build awareness and understanding of our issue with the people who we want to donate? That's that left column. What are we going to do right now, specifically over the course of the next, say, two to three weeks, to help them understand our work and acquire them as the person who should follow us and understand more about our issue and the families and people that we're serving. How do we get them to take the first action of being a supporter? And that supporter means maybe they sign a petition with us to maybe they decide to do a donation. Don't expect everybody's ready to be a donor. Don't expect everybody's ready to do virtual volunteerism. And then from there, how will we bring them even to be an advanced supporter? Maybe we'll use some match money and so on sit down with your teams and walk through this pathway together and make sure that you're prepared for the end of the year as well, which kind of pivots me towards our, our time with Excel. Kathy and, and Fred and team have talked about, and Hannah um, have talked a lot about sort of this, this fall's course, and I hope that you will join us. We'll, we've made it as adaptable as possible. We'll have for our levels, um, for our fundamentals level, we'll have even a morning or afternoon session. You can join any session. Whatever works for you in your own schedule, we're going to be there. We're providing technical assistance time, going through your direct mails if you need me. I've read a lot. I can do that for you. We'll, we'll do that one-on-one -on -one together. Cohort training, as Fred had talked about, very, very important with your peers and colleagues. We're setting up times together to do that too as well. It's a course over three months. Here's what you'll get at the end. We'll work on this together for your own organization. We're going to work on your fundraising appeal for the end of the year because I know all of you have to do one. Uh, it, you do have to do one, trust me. You have to have one for the end of the year. Uh, and then lastly, of course, is you'll be able to, to, to get together and learn and, and at least have all of these resources, including all the presentation case studies from the Pittsburgh organizations we have worked with through the years, uh, as well as learn from your fellow peers and teachers. I actually bring in some individual leaders from Pittsburgh to help me co-teach, so you'll be able to hear from them too as well. I hope that you'll join me this fall. We'll work through this together. Uh, as, as not only your peers and colleagues do, but also me to help you as we look towards our end of year fundraising uh, time together as well. So I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Hannah, who is going to talk to us maybe a little bit about discussion and some questions. And if anybody has questions, I know they could come into the questions uh, site here as well in the chat. So Hannah, back over to you. Sure, thank you, Derek. And thank you, Kathy, so much. Um, we do have a little bit of time for a few questions. Um, please continue to put those um, into the Q&A function. You can also message me or Hannah Lopop directly if you want to remain anonymous for your questions. Um, I'll also drop the link for the Excel uh, webpage and for the um, registration link in there as well. As Derek mentioned, those courses kick off on Tuesday, August 11th. Um, we are accepting registrations through the end of the week. Um, we are getting close to full though, so please um, reach out to me directly or visit that site with any questions and if you're looking to register. And as a reminder, we are making that class as accessible as possible, so please don't let um, cost be a barrier. We can support um, and also, like Kathy mentioned, make the case, um, help you make the case as well. Um, so a first question, um, Derek and Kathy, is uh, can you touch on some quick principles, frameworks, or thoughts that may be used towards influencing positive social change? Kathy, do you want to go or do you want me? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I think that this is, there's, um, I'm going to use the word positive here in a minute. And, and this is really, really hard to be because our because they're where we are in our situation and, and, and where the public is uh, too as well. Um, when I think about sort of frameworks and principles, we have, we have often used the principle that the public responds more to positive tone and frameworks than they do negative uh, pieces overall. And what I mean by that is in the way that we present our opportunities to give. So for instance, I could say something like at the beginning, a belief statement that says that you know the world is going to go, going to end right that's a negative tone and statement versus 
we have a real opportunity in the next three weeks to help somebody affected by COVID. Are you in? Notice the positive framing of that. There's a belonging narrative that kind of goes with that uh, in general. What we see with sort of the principles as it relates to fundraising and marketing overall is as follows. Is, is that the vast majority of public response to sort of appeal work is very in the short term positive window that they see a potential effect of what's, what's happening. So towing the line between negativity and positivity is more skews more towards the positive angle. When we look at how the person, then the second piece of this is how am I as an individual part of the solution? And that is a really, really important thing that everybody wants to feel like they were a part of some change somehow. And so specifically, when we message things, and we've done this for um, even some groups in Pittsburgh where we tested in the last two years, where we would say, this is where you come in. This is your unique opportunity to contribute to changing and helping an individual or a family. And we talk about the role that the individual donor or volunteer, supporter, constituent, whatever that role is we're asking them to take in that moment can make a difference because while we, and, and we had to break this a, a lot down in sort of impact studies, uh, if you ever look at some of the impact studies, they'll always say the public, the public wants to know that they have an impact on their, get, on their gifts. Well, sure, there isn't anybody here on this Zoom call or in the general public that doesn't want to have an impact on their gifts. What they really mean when you break that down and you spend time understanding donors is they want to, they want to make sure that whatever they give you, time, talent, they, that you're adding value somehow and that they made some sort of slight change upon or they contributed in mass to some other change. And so one of the ways that we look at it for you in the framework is you might have a large goal of saying, I want to get 10,000 Pittsburgh residents fed by the end of, that, that, are, that are in need fed by the end of September they will unlikely participate in that way because it's such a lofty goal. That's a really great major donor funder kind of thing. You gotta break that down week by week and design campaigns that make people feel in that moment that they've achieved a milestone with you. Such as by the end of today, our goal is 50 more Pittsburgh residents fed by dinner time. Can I count on you? you have a real opportunity today to help me notice how I'm bridging that and I can accomplish milestones with individual constituents leading to the broader impact that you really, really want to do. So my sort of three things and principles is make it small and make it relevant in short term in this moment. Create milestones for people to accomplish and feel like they win and communicate back to them the, that what you did in that moment and how it made so, it was so impactful. And then the last thing that I would say is, is that as you design some of these things, maintain that opportunity, maintain a positive opportunity more in the negative, bound, toe the line more towards the positivity. Kathy, I don't know if you have anything else to add. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna interfere with what you just said at all. I think it's terrific. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is, this seems like a critical time to be collaborative in gathering resources. However, fundraising models are often competitive. What are your guidelines for navigating this complexity? Hey, Derek, I just have one thought about this and maybe you could comment on it. One of the things that I've been finding encouraging, and you'll, I think, have good thoughts about how to maintain your brand identity and, and differentiate yourself while working collaboratively. But more recently, we've seen a couple of collaborative fundraising models where instead of the old galas, which are tired, people have to go to a dance party or a concert or something, a number of nonprofits have come together and they have a digital platform that they're sharing and they get to highlight uh, individual work. We just saw hot links uh, being done by Kelly Strayhorn. I know that there are some other groups planning these kind of collaborative fundraisers going forward in the fall. And it's an opportunity for some big organizations to bring in some artist collective and others to open up the pathways for donor support. So that's one way I think we can overcome what's sometimes seen as a competitive landscape. And Derek, I know you have some thoughts about how people need to differentiate themselves right now. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I look at it, it, it definitely isn't in the and position. It's how do we collaborate and offer our unique story within the collaboration and keeping our brand and other elements there. Um, this time has been very, very interesting because one of the things it has exposed is either our ability to differentiate ourselves from others or our inability to uh, do that in sort of the avenue in which that we complete our social issue work or, or the impact is um, that as you are looking at creating the uniqueness is is sometimes that uniqueness is more, or that, that differentiation happens at the middle, sort of middle donor level and higher, whereas individuals support an issue. Uh, when they're supporting that issue at the lower level, say 500 and lower, they're unlikely to kind of know the landscape as much as those who've probably been supporting it for a while and, and, and looking at it from that perspective. So one thing that, that I would mention for you that we often go through, if you feel like people are not understanding the difference between your organization and say another, whether it's a competitor or a complementary um, style organization, is sit down and truly understand how you add value to that issue, that, that your perspective on it in that piece. And that becomes our unique value proposition as an organization or in the sort of social context, we call that the unique social value proposition, USVP uh, in it. And what we, what we often do in that is say, well, how is the impact on our individuals contributing or sort of curbing one aspect of the state of the issue versus others? And then in addition to that, looking at it and saying, is it the methodology or the impact side that's a differentiator um, from there? So it might be, well, the approach that we take takes these things into account, which is more maybe holistic or might be addressing an area where others are not uh, in general. But the vast majority of those under sort of your usually, and I'm making that sort of usual statement, which is really tough because it doesn't mean everybody, but usually 250 and lower, they, they are going to more still respond to sort of you talking about the issue and them being able to work through you through their gifts and affecting uh, another person. When I see direct mails targeted towards those that are under $200 in donation talking about 20 uni different unique features of the organization, we've missed how a direct mail appeal should be, which is it should focus on a belief statement helping the donor understand an individual situation, a sort of pro uh, before, during, and after intervention of impact. I mean, you're missing that opportunity. Where that kind of stuff comes in is more in your middle of the road to, to hire. Last thing I would say about differentiation and competition overall is to Kathy's point, um, a lot of organizations who have come together have decided to supplement maybe one, let's say they had four direct mail campaigns, or, or I'm sorry, four multi-channel campaigns in one year. Might be at the beginning of the year, summertime, fall, and end of year. Is, is that some have been very, some have decided, well, you know what, um, I think if we were, because we went to our donor audience in March and then went to him again, because it was right in that COVID moment when it was starting, it might be better maybe now that we collectively go with others. They have found better opportunities to supplement and take out one of their solicitations because they kind of use that early in March to come together in a more collaborative fundraising appeal. Say, um, I have some organizations doing that for back to school. It's basically a back to school citywide campaign or a back to school campaign for the region. And then it has four to five different organizations who are in there and they all decided to kind of uh, decide to split up the resources together. And one of the things that they did is talked about how these organizations collectively together really fo focus on, and I'm sure you've heard kind of similar language, the student as a whole, right? It, it covers all aspects of in-person, out-of-person, at home and so forth. And so their donors really got excited because they're like, oh, wow, this, this really is holistic approach to supporting all, uh, uh, a student holistically in their sort of education and learning this fall. And so it's been a very effective campaign and that campaign's going on, I believe in Oakland that we're monitoring right now. So. Some examples there of where collaboration and yet differentiation is important. Thank you, Derek. We do have time for um, one more quick question. 
Um, and just as a reminder, we are collecting all questions and we will get responses out to um, each of you before the end of the week. So for this final question, um, can you talk about who should sign up for Excel fundamentals and who should take advanced Excel, knowing that this year there's no prerequisites for the courses? Sure, uh, absolutely. So the fundamentals is definitely for anybody who hasn't taken one of our courses before. And specifically, we cover um, what we would say fundamentals, which is things around the supporter approach to constituency and model building. We'll talk about it. We'll even break down messaging a lot more, talk about things related to direct mail appeals, multi-channel fundraising campaigns, email, social media, some of the more fundamentals of running a, sort of a four to three part fundraising campaign season or year. Um, some basic tenants are there too and understanding what goes into those things. In the advanced side, that specifically is, is for those that uh, have either taken a course or I would say have, have years of experience running different types of multi-channel fundraising campaigns. Uh, they're doing high segmented campaigns, maybe for particular audiences as well. And we get into a lot of constituency building work, um, which is you know something that such as on the movement side, uh, building around awareness environments. Uh, we spend a little bit more time, less time on sort of the appeal work and more time on the upfront. How do we design work and campaigns to gather more people in and around us and around our issues? So that's where we spend most of our time. 